it's an honor for me to be speaking here today, to be asked on this occasion and uh, with the esteemed company and all of our brothers and sisters to be able to share some thoughts on the process of uh, decolonization and the, the realization of, uh, of the goals of our people around the world for justice and freedom and to be a person who reflects back on that in this company is something that I really have been looking forward to ever since now contacted me about the opportunity to come and share some thoughts with you and so I'm really honored and humbled here today and I say humbled also because I know the background of people here uh, both intellectually academically scholarship but also in terms of their knowledge and experience on both of the subjects that I'll be speaking on um, on one hand um, I'm a bit intimidated to be sitting here in, in this company talking about the philosophy of Gandhi um, I'm, I've read some of Gandhi's work, I've reflected on it, I've spoken to people who have had, uh, who have been influenced and who have, uh, who know it much better than I, I should say. And so I offer my thoughts on Gandhi very humbly to you today. Uh, also in terms of the Gayanera Goa and the great law for my own people, uh, one of the great things that's been happening in our own communities over the last few years is that there's been a big push towards cultural revitalization and language revitalization. And there was a time when someone like me get up and speak with uh, somewhat of, uh, of assumed authority on the meaning of the great law um, in that context. Uh, today, that's no longer the case. I'm a person who's learning, and there are many people who know more than me about the great law, about the Guyanita Goa, and who learn, from, who learn about the Guyanita Goa in the language. And in the last few years, uh, those people have surpassed people of my generation in their, in their implicit understanding of the meaning of that. So in both these senses, I'm speaking to you as a person who's on a journey of trying to understand. And I guess this, the, the place that I occupy is of a person who's taken these two ideas and these two teachings and tried to put them into practice over a long period of time. And so I want to offer you that as my perspective, not as an authority on the great law, not as an authority on Gandhi, certainly, but as an authority on me <laughs> and my experience that I've had in trying to take all the best of the world's teachings to come to a realization of who I am as a Ngwahuwe, as a native person, and what my responsibilities are as a good person moving forward in the world, trying to achieve justice for my people and to have that be a movement for justice for the whole world, starting with the place that I stand, which is my own body, and starting from the place and then emanating from there outward towards all of the relationships that I have in my life, and then hopefully over the course of time, and if we're successful, interacting with people in such a way that they can be impacted and change their lives so that we can have justice and have the good principles that we all share govern our lives as opposed to the ones that have come into our lives that cause that unwellness, that unhealth, that pain, and that discord. From this position, looking back in terms of uh, what people noticed in my work that caused me to be invited here today <laughs> in the book that I wrote with Saze, um, it was a work on trying to understand what an effective, authentic pathway of decolonization could be for our people. And I wrote this book between 2001 and 2005, and at that time, <coughs> the philosophy the example of the decolonization in, in South Asia and particularly in India was very, very um, interesting and compelling to me. Recognizing, of course, the vast disparities in time and place and numbers and, and politics and so forth. But it seemed to resonate with me when I read Gandhi's work and when I talked to people that had uh, more knowledge of Gandhi's work, the principles that and the spirit that that movement was suffused with seemed to resonate with what I was learning about the principles and the spirit of our movement, or at least what some of us aspired that movement to be. And at that time, as I was reading about Gandhi, as I was trying to understand the, the philosophical principles and the spiritual rootedness of it, I was talking to mothers at Six Nations, I was talking to knowledge holders all over these communities, and I saw so many connections. And as I started off saying, 
I'm not coming at it from a position of authority saying those connections are real and that I'm going to defend them. But for me, it was resonance. And I put that into that book. That was 2005. It's now 2018. And that book and the teachings in them that I drew on Gandhi, from Gandhi still continue to resonate with me, but in a different way. It's, it's like the teachings have levels. There's the political level. There's the kind of strategic thinking that he brought. There was the kind of thinking about what a good society is and so forth. And then there's the kind of spiritual rootedness of it. And on all those levels, I've continued to kind of read and think about, and I think that on the, on the side of the building of a movement of indigenous peoples for justice in our own country, we've continued on that process of deepening it too, and gone deeper into our own tradition. So that dialogue is continuing in my mind. And I think it's a good opportunity here today to have a discussion about what true decolonization is. Gandhi has something to teach us about that. But our Guyana Goa in the Haudenosaunee communities also has something to teach. And I think that anybody who's thinking about decolonization in a global sense would do well to think about those resonances and to think about taking that further. What is it that's universal in Gandhi and what is it that's universal in the Guyana Goa? And that's what I want to talk about today and share my thoughts. And as you see, I have no notes, as is my normal style, for those of you that have seen me speak before. But it's also because I think that in sharing thoughts on the subjects like this, it's important to feel and to express with authenticity what the feeling is and to have a genuine dialogue. So as I'm speaking, if there's something that I say that doesn't quite resonate with you, that causes you to react in a certain way, hold that and we'll have a discussion about it later. That's just as important for me, the discussion, the dialogue, the interaction, as anything I'm going to say in the first part. And I think when we leave here, we'll leave here with a greater understanding for that discussion, much more so than for anything that I'm, that I'm going to lay out to provoke the discussion. So the first thing that I took from Gandhi was probably not going to be any surprise to anybody that's a Gandhi scholar and knows is the concept of, uh, the first thing I interacted with and took from was the concept of Satyagraha. And first of all, I want to ask the ex experts in the room, how do you pronounce that properly? Satyagraha. <laughs> it's a Sanskrit word. How do we pronounce it? Satyagraha. Satyagraha. Because there's a lot of people I hear pronounce it in different ways. And so, so Satyagraha. And when I encountered that term, and read about it and thought about it, my own understanding and take that I took from it is that it's embodying the truth. Is that right? Is that good? First point made. <laughs> I told you I'm a bit intimidated in expressing my understanding of Gandhian philosophy and thought. Um, embodying the truth. The resonance of that with our own way of thinking, I'll, I'll express as I go along. But embodying the truth to me, is the fundamental goal of decolonization. Because colonization has been the creating, the creating and the enforcement of lies, mistruths, misconceptions, false identities, and so forth, put upon the colonized people that we have been forced to live with and that we have been forced to, over time, assimilate into our own being. So in 2001, when I was confronting these issues, the book that I wrote with Saze followed one previously called Peace, Power, Righteousness, where I was basically pointing a finger at all the native leaders in the country, saying, you're all doing it wrong. You're all co-opted. You're all assimilated. You're embodying the white man's values. You're da 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 all this kind of stuff. Believe me, I knew from experience, because I worked in politics for about 20 years before then, and I had worked in the band system, and I had done all this, and so I was writing from a position of experience. But when I wrote Wasaze, I was at the point of questioning 
Well, what's the alternative? You know, if they're all corrupt, even if they're not bad people, they're, they're, they're living out a vision of a native leader, of a chief. Most of the people I was criticizing were men at that time. I think all the people I was criticizing at that time were men, because almost all the people that held positions of authority were men at that time. If they're living out this false vision of what it is to be Ongwehunwe, a native leader, well, what's the truth? That kind of led me to a logic. And I looked around and I'm like, well, it's not only the leaders and the way they're acting, carrying out values that are not ours. Our whole system's constructed that way. Our whole identity. Trace it back. The idea of all the way back to the early contact days of colonization when things started to go wrong and the idea of an Indian in our sense in North America being a corruption of someone's understanding of where they were in the world. You know, we're called Indians because the Europeans thought they were in your country. Right off the bat, our sense of ourselves in the English language and as it got built into the institutions and the knowledge base of these societies is wrong. The Indian Act, laws, all of the ideas in popular culture and media and so forth constructed this idea of another that had very little to do with who we were. It was almost no reflection of our teachings, our philosophy, our languages were gradually marginalized and put, put aside and so forth. To the point where in 2001, when I started writing this book, in dialogue with indigenous people of all ages, all, everyone around the communities, it was like we've forgotten who we are. There are people who know, but as a society, we're very far away from our true existence. And the process of colonization was just that. It was, it was a whole set of techniques, strategies, tools, processes. Some of them enticement oriented, some of them enforcement oriented to move us away from our true self. So when I read that, embodying the truth, a movement for truth, it immediately struck me. That's what this is. That's what decolonization is. And I wove that into my, my, my analysis of, of colonization and decolonization and wove that into the philosophical message that I was trying to put forward in that book and the speaking that I was doing at that time. I should say there's people wearing orange shirts. It'll take a minute to say there's people wearing orange shirts today. For those of you that are not familiar, it's uh, Orange Shirt Day today officially, although it was mainly marked on Friday uh, during the work day. But the, the reason people are wearing the orange shirts is to commemorate the experience of the people, the children who went through Indian residential schools. The Indian residential schools were a significant, uh, a sim a significant aspect of the Canadian government's efforts to eradicate our people culturally, uh, to remove the children from the families to remove the children from their language, their culture, and the land, and to transform them into um, citizens that were useful to Canadian society, either as labor or as political subjects. And so we're commemorating every year the, the suffering of those children. But I, I should say also the resilience of our people to still be here today, to wear these shirts, and to say, we're still here, and it didn't work. So I just want to you know, acknowledge the people in the room wearing those shirts. It's September 30th. And the reason they're orange is because the story of, of, uh, of uh, uh, a little girl who went to uh, residential school in uh, Williams Lake, I believe it was, Williams Lake in British Columbia. And uh, she, the story in a short version, if I'm wrong, anybody correct me, but she went there uh, proud, hopeful, with the shirt that her grandmother had given her it was orange, and the first thing to do was rip it off her and force her to conform, and, and, and so went the story of her, her suffering. And so the shattered dream of a, of a good education, of respect, and all that is commemorated every year now. And, uh, and so 
That's an illustration of one of the policies that the Canadian government used to move us away from our true self. So this idea that we have now in the decolonization of Canada, if you think about now the, the, the philosophical orientation that many people in the arts and academia and politics are embracing and enlivening with their own work and thoughts and so forth is, is, is indigenous resurgence. A lot of people are referring to it as a resurgence of indigenous nationhood, a resurgence of culture, a resurgence and so forth. And over the, over the years since the early 2000s, it's really come to reflect, I think, that principle that comes from Gandhi of let's recover our true self. And how do we do that? Those are the things that are being worked out by people on the ground in their own minds in many diverse ways. But it's significant that people recognize that mischaracterization of our existence as the root of colonization. Because they recognize that it would be impossible to decolonize with respect to our ancestral vision and our rights in our territory if we didn't understand that we had been shaped into subjects of colonization. We understood that we were shaped into subjects of colonization. We understood that even the solutions that were being proposed were solutions that served other people and not us. And so it's a resetting back to our true self. And I saw resonances in the struggle that your people and people in India went through to recover their true selves, the roots of their existence, and so forth in that. That's the first point that really drew me to the philosophy of Gandhi and how it wove its way into the philosophy now has come to end life in our movement. The second one is the other big principle, as I understand, is Swaraj. Did I pronounce that one right? Yep. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Swaraj. Self rule on a, on a basic sense. The way I understood it, self rule, even in Gandhi's philosophy, had different levels. It was a, a complex concept. It didn't just mean self-government. When I first encountered it, that was the immediate re resonance that self-government. Of course, that resonates with our struggles. We want self-government. We want to control our own affairs. And this one has been well researched, well communicated, and forms the basis of the indigenous political movement. So we have been controlled, just like other colonized peoples, by a system of rule. The difference being, it wasn't rule from London, it was rule within our own territories. So as opposed to colonization in, uh, in other forms, blue water colonization, we have settler colonialism. And over the years, since 2001, and explicating this and trying to bring forward a vision of clarity in regard to our situation. The idea of what colonization is in this kind of relational, power relational sense has become clear as well. And so we now speak of colonization. In 1996, I gave a speech at the, it's the Bar Association, the Bar Association. Uh, annual meeting and they were talking, it was in Victoria, and they were speaking about Aboriginal rights. And, so, and when I sat down after giving my speech, a well-known professor at the time, his name is Michael Ash, some of you may know his work, he turned to me and he said, do you realize that you're the only person who used the word colonization in this whole conference? <laughs> I always remember that. And I said, okay, 1996, the framing the accepted framing, at, at least, in academics and in law and so forth, wasn't colonization. It was the Indian problem. Our, our kind of Indian. <laughs> the Indian problem. How do we solve the Indian problem? Canadian, uh, Canadian people, jurists, professors, politicians, saw Native people as people who hadn't kept up or were somehow damaged because of the experience of history and they needed to be addressed. Those problems needed to be addressed. Over time though, we, 
come to see the problem as a problem of colonization, of an unjust political order in this country. That's fundamental, and I think that's very important. And it's driving so many of the, I want to say problems, but they're only problems because we live in an unjust political order. So the problems that Canada is facing now in indigenous politics are driven by the fact that indigenous peoples have woken up to the fact that this is a colonial reality and that fundamentally the political order needs to be changed. So when I think about Swaraj, I think about the impact of our consistent arguments about that. Here's one of those resonances. Knowledge holders in our communities, our leaders, especially in Haudenosaunee communities, but all over the country in, in different areas, have always held on to that nationhood perspective. We are a nation of people in relation to Canada or the United States. And that any imposition of authority upon us is unjust. And so we need to fix that colonial problem. And we've operated from that. But that's become the framing now. And so that's a very important aspect of the impact of Swaraj. And we've, the people who have been writing and working from indigenous community perspectives to rationalize our political movement have made that point very clearly. And it's woven its way into the law. It's woven its way into politics. It's woven its way into the culture. But in revisiting, and I think I focused on that somewhat in my book. 2001, 2005. I touched on the issue of the personal transformation aspect as well. And that's the next, I think, layer of learning that, that I take from, from Gandhi's teaching on this and what Swaraj is and what self-rule is. And here's the resonance from our own tradition as well, especially the Great Law, which I'll, I'll turn to in a, in a minute and try to elaborate somewhat, is that that power can only come from powerful people. That power can only come from strong, rooted people. And that self-rule starts with the self. I think I even used that easy quote in, in my book. Self-rule starts with the self. And I, I got that from reading and thinking about Gandhi's teachings as well. Is that it's kind of tied to that self-knowledge, the truth, embodying the truth, and governing oneself and the processes of learning I think in Gandhi's case, meditation and all of the, the, the culture that went into creating a scenario where you had a person who was in control of himself and ruling himself and able to emanate that strength out in his relationships really resonated as well. And so to me, that has become something more of a feature of my own understanding of the meaning of these, of these teachings from 2001 till, till today. So I wrote about it a little bit focused on the, the, the self-government aspect back then, but I would kind of like, today I'd have to bring those into a reverse ratio. <laughs> and then there's another aspect of, of self-rule, which I understand to be true, is the global vision of, of a, okay, I might get this wrong, and I'll have to ask for help in here. Is it Purna Swaraj? Thank you and excuse me. <laughs> if I'm correct in my reading and understanding, that's of a global set of relationships built on the universal principle of love for people. And as you, as you were speaking, I'm sorry, who, uh, the speaker was talking about his favorite quote, or it was you, Ambassador, I'm sorry, uh, of where Gandhi was... was uh, wanted the windows to be open and the breezes of all of the teachings of people all over the world to come and feel that. To me, that embodies, that story embodies that principle of Purna Swaraj. And more and more now, I think, especially since 2001, we start to see the necessity of that type of understanding of societal change, not only for the aspiration of a, of, a, of a change in the global world, but to make change in our own society as well. That things can't happen in the local without a connection to a larger global struggle. And so when I think about that principle, I think about how much it resonates with the teachings 
in our own tradition too, about how in the great law of peace, it speaks about the great white roots go in all four directions. And that if people want to live according to the teachings, they could trace the path back and take shelter underneath the leaves of the tree of peace. That's a global vision as well. And I think people who have this understanding of decolonization understand, as reflected in both traditions, that it starts with the self. It starts with a connection to that universal force, which people can call love in English. But there's a, there's a universal force that exists in the worldview of both the Ongwehunwe and in the people that Gandhi comes from that recognizes that it's that understanding and attachment and infusement with that force and using that force of love to guide one's action in politics and in relationships that creates justice in the world. And so the best way that I can talk about the connection and the similarities in our philosophy. And the cultural expression of, those, of that basic understanding is different, completely different in language, symbol, symbolism, and so forth. But it gives me so much hope to understand and to realize that our fundamental spiritual teachings resonate with the fundamental spiritual teachings of other people who have lived close to the earth and who understand the resonance of that universal force in their life. Where I'm taking it in my own work and in my own life is to use that to continue to examine, as Gandhi did with his experiments with truth, through his own life and experience, to examine the impact and the stain of colonialism on myself, on my own community. And to try to have the courage to draw courage from these teachings, to continue to do that in an honest and open way, so they can continue to share the strength that grows from that with other people. And that means confronting colonization in all of its ugliness, and all of its distractions, <coughs> and all of the ways that it makes us weak as people and as communities. And so I think that that's where we're at in our struggle now. The, the struggle in Canada, as we're living it, is fundamentally a struggle against colonization. But the challenge, and recognizing that is important, but the challenge also for people who are activists in that struggle is to recognize that while we can draw lessons from the past and other traditions and so forth, we have to make those ours for now and going forward and really think about how to, to use those teachings in a way that's effective and appropriate for the struggle and the challenges, the particular struggle and challenges that we face here today. That's where I start to look again at our own teachings and traditions, and the Guyana and Goa. And the great good way of the Guyana and Goa has a lot to teach and offer too. <coughs> it, did for, it did a thousand years ago, it did 500 years ago, 40 years ago, and it does today. And every time you look at it, if you look at it with this perspective that I've tried to outline, you get something new from it, you get something different from it. So. 30 years ago, when I was involved as a political activist, at the earliest stages of my own understanding of my own colonization <laughs> and the impact of colonization on me as a person, as a man, I drew, something I drew something from it, but it was at a certain level. Now, I look at the Guyana of Goa, and I see it with fresh eyes, and it's still teaching me. So the Guyana of Goa, is one of, for those of you that don't know, before I talk about it just a little bit, it is a fundamental law of the Haudenosaunee people. There are many important ceremonies 
There are many important teachings, thousands of stories like in every other culture. But the Gairn Goa is the great good way of our people. It's a political law. It's the basis for the, the confederacy of our people as a political body. It talks about leadership. It talks about ceremonies involved with seasonal cycles. It talks about ceremonies involved with the transition of leaders, from male and female leaders and clan mothers and chiefs. It talks about peace and war. It talks about all these types of things. And to me, in my reading, in my understanding, it's also a blueprint on how to live as a good person. And if we look at it simply as a political document, I think we're only looking at the surface of it. And so just as I would read Gandhi's teachings at these multiple levels, I also look at our own teaching and say, it's not just wampum number 65, it says this about government and so forth. It's like, what is it teaching us about how to live a good life? And I'll give you one example of how the Guyana Goa is more than just a political document, in my experience. So the Guyana Goa, the great law, it's sometimes called the great law of peace, but if there's any language speakers in the room from one of the Haudenosaunee language, like the Guyana Goa, if you say it, that Guyana Goa, it means the great good way, I think, and not necessarily the great law of peace, like in the framing of it, in the wording of it. So the great good way, it, it speaks about the formation primarily of our confederacy. And when I was a political actor primarily, I focused on that. I looked at it and said, what, what did they do to create that union of people that prevented them from harming each other and built up this great federation of people that were able to live in peace amongst themselves and defend their territory and so forth. So learned a lot from that, and I think people have approached it in that way in the past. But just to illustrate what I'm talking about, about how it's more than that, it's a set of spiritual principles too. I, I start thinking about it, start doing a little bit of deeper reading and reinterpreting somewhat based on conversations I've had. And just to illustrate one point, if you look at the formation of the League of Peace of the Haudenosaunee people, the first set of interactions that start off this whole story, this epic story of how we came to be, are of a woman and her daughter, scared, leaving the village to go hide because of the violence that's being perpetrated in the communities by warriors. That's part of the story. Think about how that resonates today with what's happening in our communities. What's the responsibility of a man reading that? What's the responsibility of anyone understanding that story in its context now? Is that just background to other stories that come forward, or is that an important teaching in itself? It says she left. They went and stayed at a place where no man came for a long time. Then it began, the great law. It talks about the real reason that the great law began, was violence in our communities. People not having Swaraj, people misunderstanding, people losing sight of their responsibilities as men, of warriorism out of control, of vengeance, of violence of all of these things being the fact of their reality. And this is why the great law came to be. This is why the peacemaker came from Huronia over to our territory. And the stories about the formation of the great law begin to solidify a different understanding of what true peace is in our community. It's not just the resolution of political conflict. In there, I drew one phrase that kept resonating with me over and over and over again. When kindness flowed through the generations. And from a direct literal translation in the language about the purpose of the 
great law. It's like when heaven and earth are in harmony, when all our ceremonies are done, when people are living in a good way, kindness will once again flow through the generations. And I think what a beautiful way to express what the whole point is. How much do we experience kindness flowing through the generations in all of our relationships? At that time, they weren't experiencing it at all. And that's why the great law came to be. When the peacemaker came and he was looking for a person in the communities that were <coughs> under such turmoil, and living in lives of violence and so forth. The metaphorical language is very, very evocative. He looked for where smoke was still rising because all the other families were hiding and afraid not to build a fire. You don't want to give away your position. You don't want to draw attention and so forth. But there were people who still believed. There were people who were still willing to welcome strangers. There were still people who were holding on to those ancestral fires and he went there. And almost every story in this great law epic is a story of transforming pain into healing, of transforming anger and aggression into kindness. And the great law becomes something completely different when you read it at that level. So the Gayanara Goa has levels, just like all these other teachings have levels, which makes it a profound statement <coughs> on a way to live a good life just like every other world-renowned philosophy that is out there. And so when I look at the Gayanara Goa, I see no difference between the teachings of the Gayanara Goa and Gandhi's teachings on peace and rootedness and power and righteousness. And in fact, peace, power, righteousness, these are key words from our Gayanara Goa as well. These are my reflections and how I continue to draw and to try to continue to develop understandings and put them into practice. The practice element is a real challenge because we're facing a situation in Canada now where we have an ongoing contemporary colonization of our, of our land and our people. So the challenge for us thinkers and activists and so forth is not only to put the work into ourselves and to try to transform ourselves, to move ourselves to a better, stronger place, many of us are doing, however difficult and hesitant that process is, that's what we're doing. The challenge is to really come to a place where we can challenge in a, in a substantial and meaningful way the control that Canada has over our existence as Indigenous people. Because Canada, unfortunately, has demonstrated that it's not going to use that control in a way to benefit our people or to create kindness and health and wellness. And so we're in a position of being anti-colonial in our own land. <coughs> anti-colonial in our own land. And the idea of indigenous resurgence is fundamentally rooted in this understanding that I've been talking about and is an alternative to other strategies that have been tried. And here's the resonance again with Gandhi. I actually took a lot of flack with Wasaze from more militant members of the indigenous movement. A lot of people think I'm a radical, and a lot of people think Mohawks are radicals, but <laughs> there was a lot of people who said that's a soft vision because you're not advocating violence. I advocated self-defense, which would have went against Gandhi, I recognize that, but self-defense, but I did, I did make a clear statement that we cannot persecute a movement based on violence. We have to demonstrate our strength through our culture, our unity, our love for our land and each other, and move forward on that basis, and then people will respond, hopefully, in a positive way. And if they don't, we just keep moving anyway. So it drew on Gandhi in terms of it's not pacifist, but nonviolent approach to social change and political confrontation. People didn't like that because there was a lot of people that believed, I think more so then than now, in more militant, violence-oriented strategies. And I dealt with the arguments of those, those people in my book. 
So between that and one which I would be legitimized, the reformist approach, very complacent kind of approach, accepting the situation and just finding a place in that situation, there has to be something else. And here's another resonance with Gandhi, I understand. This may be taking it a little bit far, but I think Gandhi had a somewhat uh, an idea, and maybe even wrote and spoke about it, of idea between uh, a ranking sort of of responsibility. So on the top, as I understand it, there was the, the Satyagrahi, the warrior of, of truth that we all know uh, he embodied. And I also believe he recognized that there was a there was a place for the physical warrior as well, but that he chose not to for strategic reasons, for his philosophical and spiritual commitments, and so forth. The one thing that he also delegitimized was the complacent coward. Right? I might be quoting him there. I wouldn't use that same phraseology for reformists today. But complacency is unacceptable. So moving forward from Wasazi to today, if you have revolutionary violence as proven to have been ineffective and illegitimate, and besides that, no one's gonna follow you when you go and try to <laughs> move in a strategy there anyway. And if reformist complacency is unacceptable, what do you do? That's what resurgence is. Resurgence builds on all of this and tries to say, let's reroute ourselves, let's represence ourselves, let's rebuild ourselves, let's restore ourselves as on Wahuwe. And then let's go and give that gift to the next generation and let them take it further. And if Canada wants to block us, then we'll fight them in whatever way we need, politically, culturally, socially, and if need be, as our people have done in the past, defend our lands physically. But it's a very different orientation than attacking colonialism. It's building up power, and it's resonating that power, and it's surging, resurgence of our people. And that's what our movement is, is today, basically. The idea of resurgence resonates and has taken on so much power in the young people because it makes sense strategically, but also because it speaks to the fundamental harm that I referred to earlier. It gives them a vision and a pathway to restore the authenticity of their own indigeneity. It sets them on a pathway to restore themselves as Ungwe and then says, go from there and challenge where you need to challenge based on where you are and try to draw people into your movement and try to make a change in your life society. And the vision is one that is not exclusionary. As I mentioned, the Gayanara Goa has roots that extend in all directions. I think resurgence does as well. 20 years ago, difficult to have a conversation with people who had social justice commitments, environmental commitments, people from different cultural communities and so forth when it came to indigenous rights because everybody misunderstood and everybody was in their own camp, so to speak. Think about now the fight against pipelines on the West Coast. There's not indigenous people who care about the environment. There's, there's hardcore environmentalist movements. There's indigenous nations talking about their rights and title to the land, all working together to confront an injustice. This is a substantial transformation in political life in Canada from 20 years ago. And that's because indigenous people have rooted themselves in truer understanding of who they are and look to their traditions, their teachings, like the Guyana and the Goa, to guide their actions and their orientations towards other people. And I think that if we continue on this process and if indigenous resurgence continues to become the framing the movement that it has the potential to be, then the society could be substantially transformed. But I think we're at a crossroads now because just as resurgence represents power, the Canadian government 
is offering a different vision. Reconciliation. Reconciliation, the way that it's been framed, is not the framework that you would think on first glance it should be. On first glance, you think reconciliation is truth-telling, bringing us all together to transform the society for the better. But in fact, reconciliation, I think, is a, is a framing of justice and injustice in this country, which allows Canadians to remain complacent on this far end of the spectrum and not really challenge the fundamental wrongs that have gone into building this society. So it allows indigenous people to be victims. It allows indigenous people to be people who have suffered. But it doesn't allow them, and in fact, explicitly prevents them from accessing the true sources of their own being, which is their rootedness to their land, their recovery of the spiritual and material power that comes from, from living out their rights as nations in their own territory. And so I often think about reconciliation as if these things are mistakes of understanding, then we're okay. <laughs> because we can correct those mistakes and we can open up the vision of what reconciliation is. And people can think about it in a different way and we can come together. So if the limitations of the current framing of reconciliation are a mistaken aspect of it, let's work on fixing it. If it's an agenda, <laughs> then we have a problem. If the mistakes of reconciliation are an agenda to keep us from realizing our Swaraj, then we have to confront it and we're in a different scenario. And so as a person who's been involved for 30 years, and trying to be useful in the struggle and trying to learn from other communities. Um, from my people to your people, I thank you for the example and the struggle that your people went into enlivening decolonization, for sharing the teachings and the philosophy that have gone into informing what we do. And I invite you to be part of our struggle here in this land as we work to transform this colonial reality into something that we can fully embrace all together as a just reality for all people here. So, thank you very much.